continue the recording. Hey everybody, today we're going to be doing a much, doing a much requested walkthrough of the first scenario to help people out who might be struggling in the beginning of the game. So we'll quickly go over a few things. Um, I really have no experience playing solo, I've only played a few scenarios solo in my life. So I'm going to try to be playing this kind of, well, not necessarily try, but I think I'm going to fall back on playing this more or less how I would normally play, which is just looking at my cards, playing them, with sort of simulated communication between the, the two people in the party. Um, so we'll kind of be playing solo, but not completely. Regardless, we will be playing on the hard difficulty, just so that there are no questions about why it might be easier, given that we are playing semi-open-handedly. Uh, we're going to be playing, again, with just two characters, uh, the Brute and the Spellweaver. I think this is a pretty easy choice just because uh, I think it's one of the two best two character starting party. I mean, of the six starting characters, one of the two best possible combinations for a two character party. Uh, the other one being Spellweaver and Cragheart. Spellweaver and Brute's just a lot more straightforward though, so it's going to be a little bit easier for new people who might be struggling to get into something like this rather than Spellweaver Cragheart, which I think is maybe even more powerful but also much more technical. Um, we will go over cards and items, I guess, first. So for the Brute, we start with Boots of Striding and Minor Healing Potion. I believe these are the recommended starting items. They're pretty good. The only other item which is really good for the Brute early on is the Hide Armor. But in order to use that, we do need to have access to his first perk, which we don't have yet. So he's just going to be wrecking those two items. On our Spellweaver, I believe the recommended starting items are a Minor Power Potion and a Cloak of Invisibility, which is actually a fine set of items to start with as well. However, we're actually going to go with the Eagle Eye Goggles. The Eagle Eye, Eagle Eye Goggles are a really core item for the Spellweaver. Uh, Spellweaver is definitely the best of the starting classes for using the Eagle Eye Goggles. And given that we have the Brute with us, so kind of a frontline tank who's going to invariably take hits for us, it's not going to be difficult for us as a Spellweaver to get into a position where we can hit three targets without putting ourselves at risk. And since we're not putting ourselves at risk, we don't really need the Invisibility Cloak. It will certainly help. And I wouldn't be opposed to buying it at some point. I mean, if I was going to continue playing the Spell Weaver, I would eventually buy a Minor Power Potion probably next, followed by a Piercing Bow and the Invisibility Cloak as far as starting items go. Uh, okay, so why don't we just go over the cards that we're going to start with. Most of this is basically directly from the guides, which you can find on the subreddit as well. Um, as the Brute, we're going to be playing Balanced Measure, Skewer, Grab and Go, Sweeping Blow, Shield Bash, Leaving Cleave, Spare Dagger, Warding Strength, Provoking Roar, and Trample. Uh, there's only one card there which really bears mentioning. The cards we're not playing are Eye for an Eye, Overwhelming Assault, and Wall of Doom. Wall of Doom is a terrible card. Overwhelming Assault is not very good. It does give us a little bit of push. So in some scenarios with a lot of traps, that might be worthwhile, except we know in this scenario there are only two traps. So this push isn't that necessary. We've already got another movement on the bottom of Sweeping Blow with push one. Less likely to set up traps, but still there, with certainly a much better top, even though Sweeping Blow's top isn't great. And then we've also got the push attack on the top of Warding Strength. So not such a big deal to not have this. Uh, this is the only one I would say that's kind of controversial to not bring. I think Eye for an Eye is probably a better card generally than Shield Bash, actually. I've come around a little bit on this. Both of these cards, Shield Bash and Eye for an Eye, are mostly just going to be move two bottoms, uh, except Shield Bash obviously has 15 and Eye for an Eye has 18. Normally this doesn't matter too much, the initiative difference between these two, but we'll get into why it matters more here. The reason why Eye for an Eye is probably a better card, so no matter what, we're never using the top speed of these cards, basically ever. They're just terrible. Um, but Eye for an Eye has a bottom which I would say has more application than the bottom of Shield Bash. The bottom from Shield Bash is also pretty bad. Um, the reason why in this scenario though we are going to bring Shield Bash rather than Eye for an Eye is because we're going to be up against Bandit Guards. And the guard um, monster deck has its early initiative at 15. It has two cards that are actually 15. This is some, the sort of thing you just learn by playing. This isn't something I've looked at for this scenario specifically, but I've played enough against enough guards in over 100 scenarios that I have no difficulty remembering their earliest initiative. So the 15 is actually going to be a magical number since if we tie with the monster initiative we get to go before them, meaning uh, even though I think Eye for an Eye is probably actually better than Shield Bash, uh, I am going to bring Shield Bash for this scenario and leave Eye for an Eye on the side. So those are our starting 10 for the Brute, for the Spellweaver. Uh, we're going to be playing Aid from the Ether, Crackling Air, Mana Bolt, Revoking Reviving Ether, Flame Strike, Impaling Eruption, Fire Orbs, Frost Armor. Pretty much all of this is standard. The only deviation is that we do have Crackling Air. This is because the Brute can provide wind for us. I think Crackling Air is a quite decent card if you're with someone who can create wind, since the Spellweaver is not capable of creating it on her own. She certainly can create it with Ride from the Wind, but this is not a real combo because it's two losses. It doesn't work well together at all. It's just a huge mess. Um, normally, if we weren't bringing Crackling Air, obviously we would be bringing Ride of the Wind, which is an okay card. Uh, but Crackling Air will have a little bit of higher upside. 
given that we do have bad access to air, although we will obviously have to communicate our need for that at some point. All right, so that that's our starting setup. We've already got the first room set up. Um, small clarification. I'm not actually 100% sure whether you are supposed to place doors or not, but we always just place them. Um, I mean, doors are 95% of the time always going to be placed where the two tiles lock, and you do place all the tiles at the beginning. So even if I don't place this door, I know where the door is going to be. So we just place it to make things a little bit simpler in terms of setting up after the, the beginning of the scenario. All right, so to start the scenario before we do anything else we need to figure out uh, normally there will be battle goals and stuff like that um, so normally there'd be a road event we're going to skip road events entirely because i don't want to spoil anything there would be battle goals but just for this first scenario we're going to ignore battle goals as well um, there's a little bit of spoileriness to this i mean in order to avoid it some people consider battle goal spoilers i don't think that's really a spoiler at this point but since some people might we can avoid it for that reason also the real obvious situation is if you're struggling to beat the scenario you can just ignore your battle goal and still beat the scenario so for the purpose of this recording, we don't need to worry what about our battle goal would be. So we just need to worry about where we're going to start. The starting places are any of these seven hexes here. So uh, starting position is very important. We need to take a look at what enemies are in the first room. We have just bandit guards, which hit for a fair amount of damage, have a reasonable amount of health, especially the elite who has 10 and shield one, but not a ton of movement. The regulars have three, but the elite has only two. This is really significant because actually we can look at the room and we can basically see a line like this. So the elite cannot go past this line and the far side regular also cannot go past this line. This means that if we stay in this corner or this corner, only one of the three bandit guards should be able to attack us unless they get plus movement, which we're usually not gonna count on. This means that a pretty clear st strategy for the first turn is going to be try to kite them back towards us to get some free range damage off on them before we actually have to engage them immediately. We never really wanna just you know, start here and say, I am Groot and run in and start attacking. So given that we're gonna do that, I think there are a couple ways we could go about doing this, which is, I think we're going to start like this. So from here, the Brute is going to be able to use Spare Dagger to make an attack. We're going to almost always try to focus down a regular rather than an elite first, because the regular has effectively probably less than half the health of the elite, because the shield won and we're not hitting for that much this early on, and only does one less damage. So the damage to health ratio is definitely in favor of the regulars rather than the elite, so we'd rather kill the regulars first to eliminate income, or to minimize incoming damage. So the Brute can spare a dagger from here and then move back. The Spellweaver can go late in the round. Presumably she's going to fire orbs. Uh, there are three targets here, so it's pretty obvious fire orbs. Usually on most classes in the game, you want to try to avoid using lost cards too early on. But Spellweaver is kind of an exception to that. She does get to use lost cards pretty early, so this is going to be less of an issue. Um, so yeah, I think this is a pretty obvious plan for both of us. So let's look individually how we're going to do this. All right, so the Brute is always going to play Spare Dagger because it's only ranged attack. We don't want to get into melee range this turn if we can, since we want to just attack and then move back. So we need to go early in the round and move back. Um, spare Dagger is 27. I think Spare Dagger is going to be early enough. To the best of my knowledge, now, I, like I said, I don't completely memorize the cards. I just kind of remember some key points. Um, the two 15s that the guards have are non-moves, and I think after that, their next highest initiative is going to be 30, which means I think if they move, they cannot go earlier than 27. So 27 is actually going to be safe for the initiative. So then we just need basically to move back, which our move back is just going to be move two. So we can pretty much use whatever card we want for that. Uh, that's a pretty good question. Just want to probably use a card that we don't really care about too much in the following turns. And hmm, I guess actually a pretty obvious choice for that. Uh, well, actually, warding, I was going to say Warding Strength, but it actually has one of our better initiatives because our initiative is pretty poor overall. So how about, uh, this is tough actually. This is relatively tough. I mean, it's basically just choosing a card to get rid of, I guess, no, Skewer also. <laughs> so Skewer and Warding Strength both have decent initiative for us. Shield Bash we want to keep because it's our good initiative. So when we get in melee range, we want to have that. Provoking Roar is also good initiative and a good attack. So both of those are kind of eliminated. Trample is actually effectively four damage against the Elite. So we probably want to keep that. Uh, so this leaves Warding Strength as an option. Leaving Cleave is our, one of our best, one of our two best attacks. We definitely want that. Sweeping Blow is a possibility. Grab and Go is our move four, which in case we need to do a six damage attack using Boots of Striding and Balanced Measure, that's out. So it basically just comes down to one of these three that we're gonna play for a move two. Um, yeah, I guess Sweeping Blow is probably the best. I don't think we're gonna need two AOE attacks. And I mean, we have Skewer as well, which is kind of gonna just be better than Sweeping Blow. I mean, even just hitting two targets for three is usually gonna be better than hitting three targets for two. I don't imagine they're going to align perfectly to hit three targets. So Sweeping Blow, I think is a pretty obvious one to get rid of. All right. So we're going to play these two cards with leading initiative of 27. Meanwhile, the Spellweaver, what is she going to do? So we know she wants the Fire Orbs, so it just depends what other card she's going to use. Now, there's a little bit to consider here, which is 
because of where the spell we were starting, if the enemies don't move, we do need to have a backup plan. If they don't move, it means that they're going to be gaining shield one, because both of their 15 initiatives give them shield one, and all their other cards, I believe, don't. So if they don't move, they're also going to have shields. So we're not going to necessarily want to move up in fire orbs. The only problem is we actually do have a limited number of non-loss attacks. We've basically got three with Mana Bolt, Frost Armor, and Flame Strike. So we really want to avoid using a non-loss attack as well. So I think we should hang on to all those cards. We're probably going to Flame Strike the following turn after we fire orbs. Um, and then probably after that, we're just going to be using our Mana Bolt and Frost Armor as mediocre attacks. Hmm. I think it's probably... Uh, Crackling Air does give us... No, actually we've got enough good initiative. Yeah, I think Crackling Air is actually a pretty easy play here. Um, this is not a card we're going to use anytime soon. We're certainly not ever doing this bottom initiative thing. I mean, retaliate thing. It's just for the, the top that we're going to use at some point. But we're already playing one loss here, so we're probably not going to play another loss in this room, at least until we rest. The general rule that I think it's Random Actuary, I wish I knew his real name right now, um, came up with, which is kind of play one... As a Spellweaver, play one loss per rest. This way you kind of always end up an even number, you know, because for example, we have eight cards. So if we lose one card now and then we lose one card when we rest, we have six cards. Whereas if we just don't lose one card, we have seven, but this is still the same number of turns. Um, and then if we lose on an odd number rather than an even number, so for example, when let's say we don't lose a card now and then we have seven cards after losing a card for a short resting or long resting, and then we play a lost card and then we rest, we're going to actually lose two cards and go from seven to five, which is actually going to jump a turn. So as a general rule, it is good to try to play like this. Now, a lot of the times you can't do this because the scenario will demand something else. However, here, I think it's a pretty safe assumption. We're, with playing one lost card, not going to play another one in this room. So we have two initiatives. Now, here, we're actually going to go to the later initiative. Fire Orbs should give us a late enough initiative to go after them, which is, again, what we want, because we want them to move towards us with none of them except the top, the front one maybe attacking us. So the reality of the situation is the Brute is going to move back pretty early on, presumably before the guards can ever come up. So the Brute's actually going to be here and we're going to be here. This does mean that the, sorry, the front one here will actually get to attack us. It doesn't really matter. It's important to not get too uh, fixated on the idea that, well, the Brute's the tank. He needs to be the one taking all the hits. And we have six health, he has 10 health, so we have effectively 16 health combined. And neither one of us has damage mitigation tools. So as long as we don't take more damage after that initial hit, it doesn't actually change anything if it's us or if it's him, because we can always just heal it, and I mean, being at 3 life or being at 6 life doesn't actually change anything. So taking one hit here on the Spellweaver is perfectly fine. So yeah, that's going to be our plan is 69. Alright, so we both reveal our initiative, 27, 69, and we flip for the guards, 35. Oh! Well, that worked out about as poorly as possible. This is, I believe, their only possible ranged attack. So. Let's take a look at what they're going to do. Before we do anything we do, we always want to figure out what all the monsters in the room are going to do, even if they don't go before us. So here they're going to go at 35, which means after the Brute and before the Spellweaver. They have move minus one and a ranged attack with range two. So at minus one move, the Elite can only move up to this row. So he can actually still only attack... Oops. Uh, he can attack the Brute, huh? No, because the Brute will have already moved back. So he can only move up to this row and he can only attack to this row. So he still won't be able to attack the Spellweaver. This back one, it's gonna be the same thing. He has only two movement because of minus one, so he's only gonna be able to go to this row as well and only attack to here. So it's actually gonna be the same outcome as what we previously planned. So this is actually gonna work out just fine. No big deal. So again, sometimes things can be scary, but we math or we figure it out, and then it's not such a big deal. Or I mean, it is a big deal, but it's always important to figure out what it's going to be before we start doing anything. All right, Brute's plan is gonna be the same as what it was when we drew it up. It's going to be doing a ranged attack on guard number six and then moving back. So, we're going to use Spare Dagger first to attack, attack three, range three. I gain the experience first, or I mark the experience first. It's really important, I think, to do this, um, especially later on when you start to get like lots of rolling modifiers in your decks and things like that. A lot of stuff starts happening once you play your cards, it's easy to forget the experience. So giving yourself the experience first is just a safe way to approach it. Anyway, uh, this is the Brutes modifier deck, this is the Spell Waivers. Both of them are exactly the same, obviously, because we are starting at level one with no perks. Um, anyway, so, attack three, range three on number six, ah, plus two. Actually, really nice, although kind of a bit awkward because he's actually only missing one life now. Um, so Fire Orb is probably going to do a little bit of overkill, but obviously can't complain about a positive modifier. Although, would have been a little tempting to wish that we had done that on the Elite. Still okay. And then we're going to use this as a move three, push one, but whatever. It's just really going to be a move two for us, and we're just going to go right back into the corner. Look at that, a Brute hiding in the corner. What is this? The Spell Waiver should be pissed. All right. Next up are the guards as mentioned so we have the elite guard who goes first he has only one movement uh, we can move to either of these spots we'll just have him move i guess to here i usually try to make it anytime there's ambiguity um, do what i think would be best for the monsters 
So the reason why this would be the best is because if we move here, then this one goes here, which is a little bit less central. If we move here, then this one goes here, which is more central. It's going to be easier for them to attack us anywhere in the room from there. And this one's always going to get to move up to here, so it doesn't matter. So, yep, I'll move the elite to there. Uh, then, oh, and I just want to clarify, that that's my own um, interpretation of the rules. In ambiguity, the players actually decide. So if you want to decide to do what you think would be the most beneficial for you, be my guest. I am just going to check the camera real quick while I make sure that everything's working. Yep, all right, perfect. So, uh, then we have the regular, which also moves up. Again, with only range two, neither of these attack. Uh, he was three, so he went first. Then we have six. He just needs to move up to here. And then he gets to make an attack on the Spellweaver. Uh, it's an attack plus zero, so an attack three, targeting the Spellweaver, minus one. Yeah, it's just two damage, not a big deal. Okay, now it's the Spellweaver's turn. It's time to go big. All right, so Fire Orbs was the plan before. There hasn't really been anything that changed it. We can still Fire Orbs all three targets. So why don't we go ahead and do that? We're gonna play Fire Orbs. It's gonna go into our Lost. We're gonna gain three experience for targeting three enemies. And we're going to hit 6, 1, and 2 for an attack 3 each. We'll just go closest for this kind of from 6, 1, 3. So 6 first, plus 0. So 6 is dead. That's a small victory. Only needed 1 there. Wouldn't have minded seeing a slightly worse modifier, but yeah, I mean, can't have it all. Next on number 1. Yeah, there's the worst modifier. So this is actually only going to be effectively 1 damage on number 1 there because he does have shield 1. And then on number 3. It's going to be three damage, and that's good because that means that an attack three on him next turn will finish him off. So overall, still pretty good. And fire orbs creates a fire for us. So we have a fire in the strong column now, which is going to be good for using our wounding attack next turn. Ooh, okay, so now we've got this bottom move. Uh, so we could move up and grab the coin. I think this is a little bit greedy. So when we're deciding to move or not, we should kind of look at what we're going to do next turn. I think the next turn is going to be pretty obvious. We're going to almost always want to flame strike. And since we've taken a little damage, we could even get away with using Mana Bolt to heal ourselves as a bottom. This does remove one of our attacks, but I think that's okay. Um, well, maybe okay, but I, I think we're going to go probably for it. Plus, that's going to give us a really early initiative to guarantee that we get this attack off before they shield or anything like that. So, given that this is only range 2, we do want to move up a little bit. I think we'll move up maybe just like this. So, our options, well, we have another number of options. We kind of move anywhere in this row. I, we want to attack the Elite with the Wound, because he has the most health, so the Wound is going to be doing the most effective damage on him. Um, so yeah, here. Actually, here works as well, because the Brute's probably going to go up into melee range, so it doesn't really matter how far up into the room we are, and this makes it a little bit closer to the door. So yeah, sure. So we'll use the full move 3 on Crackling Air to move all the way up to there. Oh, I'm an idiot. I forgot to use my goggles. <laughs> so, uh, this is... Not, was not a choice. It's again, I have no experience, or basically no experience playing solo, so it's easy to forget all the things for two classes. This is why I really love playing the game um, not solo. <laughs> I mean, that's not the way to put it, but I really like just having to control one character because I find it much easier to focus on all the things that character has. So obviously I would have wanted to use the goggles for that attack. Um, yeah, well, it's not a big deal. The attack worked out decently anyway, but there's really no reason not to use the goggles. Uh, Fire Orbs is our best AoE, and we're not going to get it again until we use Reviving Ether, which is going to be a while, and we'll probably have the opportunity to long rest before there. But, oh well, sometimes you forget your items, it's no big deal. Alright, the fire moves down, and it's the next round. So, uh, well, I guess we we're already talking about the Spell Weaver, so we can just go ahead and do exactly what we're going to do for her. So we're going to be using Mana Bolt and Flame Strike. Again, when we don't have to move, being able to use this heal on bottom gives us a fair amount of value. We don't need to heal two health, but it's kind of free. Like I said, we are going to lose out on one of our top attacks afterwards and our best initiative card, but I think it's worth it here. Um, since I, I foresee how this is going to happen is basically we're going to do a small amount of damage to him and put a wound on him, going before him certainly, so the wound is going to do at least two damage. And then the Brute's probably going to move up and finish off the regular, which means then the following turn, this guy, the Elite, should have something like four damage on him, and hopefully the two of us combined with just our one other attack should be able to finish him off. And then we won't need another attack, and we can use, for example, the top heal to heal a little bit of damage the Brute took. So I think this is all going to work out theoretically well. Now, obviously, modifiers can always throw a wrench in those plans, but I think this should be okay. So anyway, Man Bolt leading at seven with Flame Strike. Now the Brute. All right, so here we just have to do an attack three. So this is a little bit tough. So Skewer is conveniently just an attack three. Um, the only problem with it is if we were going to Skewer, we'd really want to move to here, here. Here's actually probably best because we protect the spell weaver a little bit more there. Uh, the problem is, in order to do that, we would actually have to use a move four. We only have, well, we only have one non-loss move four, which is grab and go. Huh. 
So the reason why this is rough is because grab and go is also going to provide us a significant amount of damage being our only move four using balanced measures. So that's going to give us essentially an attack six, probably the following turn on the elite. So we don't necessarily want to have to use that move right now. Oh, also, by the way, it's worth mentioning, all these enhancements, I mean, you saw I ignored it at the beginning on Spare Dagger there. Um, I'm just going to ignore these enhancements because obviously we're pretending like this is the beginning of the game. Huh. We don't really want to use the disarm because, I mean, whether we disarm the elite or kill the regular, we're eliminating one attacker anyway, so better to save the disarm maybe for later. That would be a justification for why we could actually get away with maybe using grab and go now. Because if we grab and go and skewer, then it actually isn't such a big deal that we can't balance to measure the elite if we can actually just disarm him the following turn. Especially because the Spellweaver is going to put a wound on him, it's going to slowly take him down. Uh, so that's one option. Do we have a move three? <laughs> That's rough. Yeah, we got punished for using Sweeping Blow, because in the end, if we had to move three, we could move to here. Yeah, actually, we probably should have just moved back to this row, not all the way into the corner. Uh, like I said, it's difficult playing two characters at once, unless you're used to it. So anyway, the point is, if we had to move three, we can move here and leap and cleave both of them, which would also be an attack three. Um, the, diff the problem is we actually are, are, we only have a move four, which is this, and a move three is actually the bottom of leap and cleave. Hmm... This leaves us with not a lot of great options. I think it is going to have to be grab and go. Yeah, I think it'll be okay. All right, so it's going to be grab and go skewer. Uh, the reason being, we're gonna, the reason we're going to skewer instead of leaping cleave is because simply initiative. Uh, by using skewer, we get to go 35, whereas leaping cleave, we'd have to go 54 since grab and go has bad initiative. I think this will be okay because, like I said, then we can always um, disarm the elite the following turn, and if he still sticks around after that, we can always trample him, which is going to be effectively four damage, and save our boots for later. I think this is fine. All right, so our plan is to grab and go moving to one of these spots. Basically, it doesn't really matter. They can go before us, and there's certainly the possibility that they will, because I think they have some 30s, um, but even if they do, there's essentially no way that they can align themselves that we're not going to be able to skewer two of them. The risk here is the Spellweaver could take some hits, but, well, Spellweaver can afford to lose a card. All right, 35... And seven. And for the guards, 15. Oh, All right, that's okay. Uh, it's not the worst ever, because at least they're not attacking. The shield is a little bit annoying, since we're going to be hitting two targets, going to effectively negate two damage, but it's still pretty good. All right, so we've got the Spellweaver who goes first. We're going to always attack first, because who knows what our attack could... The outcome of our attack is unknown, whereas the outcome of the heal is known. So it's also better to use the unknown card first, or the, the card which is gonna have an unknown outcome. Now we have a predicted outcome, which is gonna be doing a little bit of damage. It's very unlikely that anything unexpected could happen, but this is just a general rule to follow. Whereas using the heal, we always know what's gonna happen. And maybe, for example, if we were to like, let's say kill the enemy, we might want to move and grab a coin. Now obviously we know we can't kill the enemy because we don't have the modifiers in our deck to do that, but this is just, a, like I said, a general rule. All right, so we're gonna start by flame striking. We're gonna consume the fire in order to give this attack wound. So it's gonna be an attack three wound targeting elite number one. There's a minus one. So it's actually gonna be two, which means actually just one damage to number one. But he also gets a wound, which is really significant given his high health pool. And then yeah, we're just gonna use the bottom heal here. There's really no reason to do anything else. We could move and pick up the coin. But we can do that with any bottom where this is our only heal on bottom, so we might as well get the two health back now. So we just heal ourselves for three, which is effectively just two, because that's all we were missing. All right, uh, then it is the guards which go. So the elite takes one damage from his wound and none of them do anything. They just put up shields and retaliates. The retaliates can do a little bit of damage to the brute, but I'm sure he'll survive. All right, so now it's the brute's turn. So first we need to move four to get into position. One, two, three, four. Now, I guess I actually did forget to mention that we could have used boots of striding with any move two to get into position. But if we use the boots of striding, we're I mean, we're negating the effect we're going to get with balance measure anyway, and then, like, so we're using a move four here to save him, I mean, a move two plus the boots to get a move four, to save a move four for later, but with the boots plus any move two, we can always have a move four, so it changes nothing. All right, so we are going to skewer. Skewer gives us one experience, so we're going to gain that right away. Uh, we're going to attack in the line, so we'll target this one and follow by this one. So number one first. There's no wind to consume to get attack one in Pierce, so none of that. So on the first one, we do plus zero, which is in a three. So he has shield two, so he's just gonna take one damage. And unfortunately, we are going to take two from retaliate. Then on guard number three, a minus two. He's got shield one, so that's effectively zero damage. Well, there's some poor flips, but uh, it's not that big of a deal. And obviously, since uh, he, we are more than one, I mean, we're not adjacent to him, the retaliate doesn't affect us, even though this is kind of a melee attack. All right, and that's the end of the round. Time to shuffle the monster deck here. So, kind of 
had a few failures so far, but the good news is we haven't really taken any damage. We've only just kind of spent some cards. The Spellweaver has lost one, but the Brute hasn't lost any, so we're still fine on longevity. I think it uh, shouldn't be too big of a deal. All right, now, now what are we gonna do? This is actually more difficult, because we really kind of wanted to either kill or at least damage the regular so that we could disarm the elite here. Uh, I think that's still got to be the plan though, right? to disarm the elite so that he doesn't hit, since with the wound on him, him being disarmed is pretty good. Well, actually, no. Leaping Cleave is gonna be better here. Leaping Cleave should kill the regular and damage the elite. This will be removing one attacker anyway, because the point is the Spellweaver actually isn't capable of removing an attacker right now unless she gets a positive modifier, since she can only do an attack two and the, the regular has three life left. So there's no attack that we can actually use on the Spellweaver to get a kill which means the Spellweaver, no matter what, can't eliminate one attacker. So the only way one attacker gets eliminated is either with Provoking Roar or Leaping Cleave. Now, Provoking Roar will eliminate an attacker four, whereas Leaping Cleave theoretically should only eliminate an attacker three. However, obviously doing a bunch more damage than Provoking Roar gives it more upside, I think. So Leaping Cleave does look good here, and we kind of just want to go early, so we're just going to go and use Shield Bash as a move two to get in, well, I guess probably that position in order to Leaping Cleave both of them. Looks good. Pretty obvious, I think. So Spellweaver, mm, yeah, I think she'll find healing the following turn. There's no way we're using Impaling Eruption on two targets. Also, like I said, we're just gonna try to avoid using another Lost card before we rest here. So it's just gonna be Frost Armor as an attack. And then we have to decide which one of these cards we're the least likely to use. Um, there's a possibility we wanna make our summon or use a heal. Uh, so I guess we're just gonna use Reviving Ether because there's no possibility we're using the top of that. And so it's always just gonna be the bottom of Reviving Ether and the bottom of Impaling Eruption. The jump doesn't seem to be relevant here. Um, there could be traps on the other side of this door. We know there are two traps, but for now, I mean, for the next two turns, it doesn't really seem to matter. All right, so we're gonna go with Frost Armor leading at a 20. Shield Bash leading at a 15, and the guards at a 55. All right, easy enough. Brute goes first. We're gonna use the bottom of Shield Bash as a move two. We're gonna move to here rather than to here, just so that we're closer to the door. All other things are pretty much equal here. We gain one experience from leaping cleaving both of them. We're gonna go with the regular first because we really want to kill him actually. So this is the one that matters. Oh no, punish. Oh gosh, that's the worst. All right, so he just takes two damage. So he has one life left. Fortunately, the spell weaver should be able to finish him off with frost armor. Uh, crossing our fingers. And then on the elite, another minus one. We are getting some great modifiers here. So this makes this effectively an attack two which is just one damage to him since he does have shield one. Taking a while to take that guy down. Good thing we got that wound on him. All right, and it's the Brute's turn. Now the Spellweaver goes. So we have no reason to move right away since we already have a range three targeting the regular, which is the one obviously we want to kill since he's only missing one health. Our attack is more effective on a target without shield and we want to eliminate an attacker. Ah, there's a plus one when we only needed one damage. Oh well. Can't complain too much. At least we're taking out an enemy. So he's dead, now we have a move four jump. Mm. This is tough actually. Depends how many of these coins we think we're gonna pick up. So if we didn't think we were gonna pick up all the coins in the room, it'd be better to use more movement to get closer to the door and go here. But I think we wanna pick up all the coins we can because um, we're pretty greedy. So we're instead just gonna move to this coin here. It doesn't matter that we move adjacent to him because the brute win at initiative 15, meaning the monster will attack, I mean the guard will attack the brute rather than us anyway. And we're back at full health, so it didn't matter too much. We could have considered using an eagle eye goggles there. I, I really got to try to pay attention to the fact that I have these items in the spell over. I guess I'm sitting too much to the brute, but uh, the reason why it might have been tempting to use the eagle eye goggles there was because it was so important that we didn't miss on that attack uh, or get a minus two, which is only two possibilities, but still, it was actually like three, I mean, well, more than three damage. Well, three damage and then strength, and I guess maybe it doesn't matter, but still, that would have had an impact on, since there's still the possibility we long rest before we need to AOE again. Eh, whatever. It's not the end of the world that we didn't do it. All right, now the guard goes, takes one damage from his wound, and is going to make an attack four, targeting the brute. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, all right, so that's an eight. We are not, <sighs> oh no, we've already taken two damage on the brute, right? Yeah, yeah, from the retaliate, so we have to lose a card. Have no choice. That was quick. Oh, this is actually really rough. Because we actually don't want to lose any of these cards. We could lose two cards from our discard, but that's just a lot more longevity lost. These are some of our best cards. Balance Measure is our best attack. Trample, I mean, we know that the Bandit Guards have shield and the Living Bones later on will have shield. I mean, Trample's a pretty good attack. It's effectively an attack four for us against a lot of enemies. Broken Roars are only CC. Warding Strength is just a nice loss. Oh, man. 
no good choices here. I mean, I'd much rather get rid of Shield Bash or maybe even Skewer, Grab and Go. Yeah, Grab and Go, Sweeping Blow. Any of these cards I'd really be happy to get rid of. It really sucks to have to lose one of these. Hmm. Ah, oh, man. That's rough. Also, there are two traps left. We kind of need the Warding Strength push as well as the loss for later on. Provoking Roar is our best initiative. <sighs> it's going to have to be Trample. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be Trample. I'm not sure that's the right decision. But it is the decision. That was a brutal crit. All right, well, that's uh, the end of the round. This guy also gets strengthened because he's so pumped about that eight damage he just did. Whew. Well, the, uh, the provoking roar might have been better in the end uh, to prevent that attack, but there's no, no way we could have known that that exact outcome would have happened. And taking a little bit of damage wouldn't be a big deal since this warrior is almost certainly healing this following turn here. Uh, the other reason Provoking Roar would have been really risky to lose is because we know that guy has strengthened now, and he's still wounded, so being able to get a disarm on him is going to effectively do two extra damage with the wound, because obviously he'll have two turns where he doesn't get to attack. Uh, I mean, two turns of taking wound damage before he ever attacks again, that's what I mean to say. And he's strengthened now, so making sure that he doesn't get the strengthened attack off and do an insane amount of damage again is pretty important. All right. So, like I said, for the Brute, it's pretty obvious here... Mm. The question is just which one of these two cards we play. I guess we'll keep Warding Strength. It doesn't really matter much which one we get because we're going to let it short or long rest the following turn anyway. Um, I guess it's just... Actually, I'm not sure which one of these cards I'd rather lose. Whichever one I play, there's a small chance I lose it. So I guess that's the justification. But I like this in case I need this initiative. I don't know. Actually, it's basically the same. Let's not worry about it too much. Provoking Roar then. And Spell Weaver's just going to go... You know, I guess the earlier of the two doesn't really matter at 70, just in case she does wants to do a generic atop attack, although she's most likely going to be using a top heal here. And for the guards, 50. All right. So, Provoking Roar. Uh, we can do this first, then we can move afterwards. Probably end up picking up a coin here. So we're going to do an attack two, disarm. What on earth is this? That is some great modifier draws. All right. Uh, so that's zero damage, uh, but he is disarmed. And then we're just going to probably move using the bottom of balance measures and move two, pick up this coin. Oop, put that here. And that's our turn. Then this guy goes. He's going to lose his disarm and strengthen. Doesn't move anywhere because he's already adjacent and takes one damage from his wound. Uh, yeah, looks like actually the Spellweaver probably does want to just do a generic two attack um, rather than playing eight for the Aether. Eight for the Aether would heal for two, but. We really do want to kill this guy. Actually, let's see. So he has three health left in wound, so he's effectively two health left in shield one. Let's see. Yeah. Huh, this is tough. So there's a lot to consider because we have to think about what we're going to do afterwards. So the brute, I mean, at this point, especially the advantage of having all our negative modifiers out here is we've actually only got a miss and a minus. Uh, we've got two minus ones left, I guess. Um, but if we do, for example, I know we lost trample. I was going to say because trample is the safe attack here. We actually don't have a great single target attack against him. We don't really want to open the door this following turn, though, right? So the Spellweaver can actually probably get away with long resting. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know. Uh, that's tough. Actually, I actually think I'm going to go with the heal. I think it's safe. I think the Brute plus the wound damage is going to be enough to kill the Elite. So I think I'd rather get the heal in now, long rest next turn on the Spellweaver. Like I said, it's a shame we didn't use the Eli Goggles now, obviously. Um, the reason why we're going to long rest is we're not actually going to heal anything, we're not going to get our item back, but it's actually just going to extend our longevity, because the Spellweaver probably doesn't need to do anything next round. Um, I mean, we'll see. But anyway, yeah, so we're going to just heal, use a heal three, targeting the Brute, and I guess we will move four, one, two, three, four, right up next to the door. All right, so the Brute is always going to short rest, so we get to do that first, actually, because that's not the end of the round. Um, Spellweaver, I guess, also has to decide whether to short rest or not, so actually it's done at the same time. Because, uh, all right. Hmm. So Leaving Cleave is a three, which is two effective damage. That is enough to kill. I mean, so any attack three is enough to kill this guy? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the spell we were going to get away with long resting here just to extend longevity. The other advantage of long resting for the spell weaver, obviously, is you get to choose which card you lose, which is actually pretty important for the spell weaver. We lose Grab and Go. Yeah. Their guard dreams. Yeah, yeah actually, I'm going to pay one life for this. I really, I do need this move four. I want to do a big balance measure attack once the scenario, I think. It's going to be pretty important. So let's lose another card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So why I think this 
theoretically it was worth it. We just have not gotten very lucky in this scenario. So the things we could lose that we wouldn't mind would be like Shield Bash, Skewer. We want to keep these things. So I'd say there's about, well, I guess there was less than a 50% chance, but I think even losing any of these cards, maybe except for Spare Dagger, is probably better than losing Balance Measure or Grab and Go combo. Yeah, whatever. Ugh, that's rough. That's really rough. <sighs> okay. And Soul Weaver is long resting, so it doesn't do anything now. Go to the next round. So, like I said, the Brutus needs to do an attack three in order to finish this guy off. We're going to go early in the round. We're just going to use Skewer. Um, Skewer is the worst AoE for us than Leaping Cleave, generally speaking, unless we're creating an air, which we're not going to, I mean, not necessarily going to be creating an air. And the first air we create is probably going to be for the Spell Weaver. So we're just going to do this as an attack three. Um, we could use Warding Strength as well, but there's a 50% chance that there are traps in these next rooms. So we might need the push when we get into that room. And uh, Leaping Cleave, like I said, is better. And Spare Dagger's range, which is also very good when I'm in a new room. So Shield Bash plus Skewer, planning to just Skewer attack him and kill him uh, and Shield Bash for the initiative. All right, so Guard Flips a 15. And this is why the 15 on Shield Bash matters. If this was an uh, eye for an eye, Guard would actually be going before us and this would be much, much worse here based on his action. All right, um, so we're definitely not gonna do this first because you might think, well, we can just sit here and shield or whatever. But first of all, if we kill him, we obviously want to get a coin. Second of all, if we don't kill him, we want to move away from him so we don't get attacked by him. Uh, so yeah, pretty obvious, we're just gonna do a skewer, targeting him, gain one experience. Attack three, plus one, so it's a four. That's great, because that's three effective damage. That means we kill him before the wound needs to. Uh, and that means we actually get to place a coin here. And again, because we're greedy, we are just gonna go ahead and pick that coin up rather than moving one closer to the door. I think the, well, now, I think it's fine now because be one closer to the door. Well, I would, I would pick up the coin anyway, let's be honest. I want money. But um, being one closer to the door could be significant because there are two ways we enter the room as a brute. One is doing like, you know, grab and go, uh, bottom move plus balance measure top. Boots of Striding, this gives us six movement, which is usually, for example, from here enough to get like halfway into the room and hit almost anything in there for a big attack, usually killing him in one hit. Uh, however, because we don't have balance measure anymore, we're gonna always enter the room using um, Spare Dagger, which means we can probably, again, hit more or less anything um, pretty safely. So I think it's fair to get the coin. But like I said, I'd be getting the coin anyway. No reason to leave money behind. And the Spellweaver's gonna long rest. So the Spellweaver gets to choose what she loses. Like I said, this is the most significant part, in addition to extending longevity here, uh, is by being able to choose what we lose. Hmm, crackling air is attempting. Uh, we don't run the risk where the Spellweaver, you know, when she short rests, if she doesn't get Reviving Ether, she can never reroll. Because if you reroll into Reviving Ether, you probably just lose the scenario. Hmm. I think we want to keep some non-loss attacks, but Frost Armor, I mean, the two worst cards here by far are Frost Armor and Crackling Air. This is pretty much what we're choosing between. Um, there's a possibility, I'm not sure how distinct it is that we want to use Crackling Air. Uh, I'm not so sure, actually. The reason why I think we're not gonna use Crackling Air that soon is the next loss I'd really like to play is actually my summon. Um, getting a summon, especially, you know, from here to here, it's actually not a lot of movement. Like from running here down to the other end of the room it is, but once we get into the center of this room, where we'll probably be fighting, it's then only a short distance into the next room, meaning our summon will most likely get to attack everywhere. I mean, for the rest of the scenario. So getting him up would actually be quite good. And since we're gonna play that as a loss soon, and Impaling Eruption is definitely going to be a better loss in the short term than Crackling Air. I don't really see room to play any more losses. So, yeah, I think I prefer to get rid of Crackling Air here. All right, and we need to reshuffle this. So, we're both going into the next room this turn. Uh, we need to discuss initiative a little bit in order to figure this out. And then get going. All right, so... Probably want the Brute to go in first. The Brute's gonna be using Spare Dagger, like I said. Probably won't have enough movement. Let's see, if we, I guess there's really no reason to save Grab and Go at this point. Well, maybe they want to get closer. Since this round we get to do a ranged attack, the following round we do have to melee attack. So let's see if we just use a move three. Um, we're probably gonna save Leaping Cleave in order to be able to actually hit two enemies with our best AOE, since this is actually our best attack left. So I think the move three from Sweeping Blow would be best to use. One, two, three. So we get to here and we can attack to here. I think covering basically half the room is probably gonna be enough. I think we don't need one more move from Grab and Go. And worst case scenario, we can always use our boots now anyway, 
you know, you can always use the boots once you started moving. So for example, this is what we're gonna play. We do a move three, we have one movement left. If we see that we can't get in range, we activate our boots, get two more movement, and then we can move all the way in. And we don't need to save the boots at this point anyway, since we don't have the balance measure combo anymore. So I think this looks good. Spell reader, what's she doing? Uh, definitely not gonna start off an impaling eruption here because we don't know where the enemies are in this room. So we can't guarantee that we're gonna hit a bunch of them in the line. Uh, it's probably safe to just use a decent ranged attack. Um, all things being equal, Mana Bolt's just a better card to keep. So we'll just use Frost Armor to start here since the initiative doesn't matter so much. Uh, we probably wanna go after the Brute anyway. And in that case, mm, yeah. So there's a chance we wanna use Impaling Eruption in this room, which means I guess we're gonna use Reviving Ether uh, as our move here, since we're not gonna be using the top of Reviving Ether anytime soon. And we want late initiative. This is gonna give us a move forward late initiative. So we're gonna go at our 80 rather than our 20, like I said, to make sure that we go after the Brute so that we don't get focused by whatever is in this room, okay? So we flip an 80, we flip a 27, and it's time to head in. So the brute goes first, move three, one, two, we have one movement left. And let's see what we're getting ourselves into. All right, actually, I need to take a look at the scenario book. All right, and we have an elite archer in the back, and two regular guards up front. Here and here. And surely enough, two traps blocking the door. So our push on warding strength is gonna be quite good here, actually. All right, uh, so now we flip. Guards, they are moving, that's unfortunate, but they have minus one move, still two movement, that is enough to get to us. That's, yeah, that's unfortunate. And archers, also moving. They have a lot of range in the movement. So the Elite Archer has three movement, five range. Three. Yeah, so it can pretty easily attack anywhere. Uh, plus one. Oh, no, minus one range, so only four. Okay, one, two, three. So only to the door, actually. This is interesting. So if we move back out. Huh. Ugh. This is, this is tough. So the guards have minus one move, so they only have two moves, and so they only get to go basically adjacent to the door. And the archer, like I said, has three movements, so she's gonna go one, two, three, and then she has five, four range, because she has minus one range. Two, three, four. So she can actually only attack the door. So if we do actually stay on the door to make a ranged attack on one of the enemies this turn, we're gonna get attacked by three things. If we, however, just use one more movement and move back, nothing in this room will attack us. Um, this is unfortunate because we won't get to attack anything as the Brute, but this is definitely worth it because look, Spellweaver goes at 80, so she actually goes after the guards move up, so she still does get to make an attack. So the Brute is effectively losing an attack three, gain one experience here, in order to avoid effectively, what, nine, yeah, nine, ten, ten attack, definitely worth. All right, so as the Brute, we just move one back and ignore anything else we could do this round. Um, since you cannot attack in the middle of movement, it's not like we could stop here and make our attack three. Or attack three, range three, and then go back here and here. Like I said, one, two, three. We just target to there, so we don't get to attack. It's really important to make decisions like this, though. Minimizing incoming damage is one of the most important things you can do, and a mistake that a lot of people make quite often is just, well, I'm supposed to attack, and I'm going to use lose one of my best range attacks here, and I'll lose, but discard it, and not have it again, so I might as well use it. Now, this would be a mistake. All right, so next up is the archer. So like I said, the archer has just three movement. One, two, three, and four range. One, two, three, four. Just the door, not enough. Then the guards go. Guards move up two each. Attack no one. Cannot attack through the wall here. Only adjacent to this spot on the door. All right. Now it is the Spellweaver's turn. So uh, no reason to move first. We're just going to do our attack. Which one we attack doesn't really matter much. We'll attack the opposite one, number two, for an attack two, range three. Plus zero. So that is just two damage to bandit guard number two. All right. So in this situation, um, well, in general, archers are probably more threatening than guards, and they do have more threatening flips, I think. But here, the archer actually does the same amount of damage as the guards. So we're probably going to kill the guards first because they have less health and they're closer. So I think it's safe to just look at it like that. Now we have to decide whether we want to use this movement. The only advantage of not moving would be that we can flame strike, actually, since this... With this bottom and this top, we could do essentially two attacks. I actually like this a lot, I think. Um, so if we stay within range two, whereas if we move back, 
guess we do have range two on this target. I always find this line of sight kind of confusing, but I guess theoretically this is line of sight. It's just kind of like peeking around the corner. Um, but from here we can attack this one, which is the one we've already attacked. So theoretically doing two attack twos, targeting him, should finish him off for us and allow the brute to focus on another target. So I think we're going to stay exactly where we are, just not use the movement on the bottom of this uh, reviving ether. And then we're good. And that's the end of the round. So brute first. Well, leaving cleaving isn't looking good here. Sweeping blow was, but we don't have that anymore. Can't. Mm, uh, we can actually. Uh, time to look at what these traps are actually. So they're just damage traps. I should double check just to make sure. I think they're going to be four damage. Uh, yeah, the traps will be four damage. So pushing something back into those would be good. I'm not sure if we have to do that right away though. But we could. We could. So I mean, basically have these as options. Hmm. So I would say there's kind of like two choices here. Leaving cleave isn't very good here. So choice one is something like we use grab and go as a move four to go further into the room. One, two, three, four. Although we can even theoretically use the bottom of leaving cleave, but we'd rather use the bottom of grab and go than leaving cleave because leaving cleave is a good top attack. Um, so we use that plus our boots to kind of move over here and then push the archer into one of the traps, doing a significant amount of damage to her because the four plus our attack three is actually going to be seven. Plus we need to clear out one of those traps so that we can get through at some point. The other option is just to move up and disarm one of the things. Uh, I think I actually like this the most, in fact. Um, because it's gonna, even if we push the archer into the trap, we're not actually going to eliminate one attacker this round unless we get, you know, a crit or a plus two. Uh, would a plus two? Yeah, plus two would do it. Uh, which <laughs> I don't really want to count on at this point based off of how well the modifiers have treated us. By provoking Roaring, one target, we actually are going to eliminate an attacker. Plus it gives us earlier initiative, so I think it's a little bit safer. We just have to decide which card we're going to use with it. Uh, we know we want to keep Warding Strength to push her into the trap probably the following turn which means we either use Leap and Cleave or Grab and Go. I think we can use Grab and Go because actually what we can do now, now again, this is always, we have to count on the modifiers working out on average, but if we do use the Grab and Go as a move four, one, two, three, four up to here and do the Provoking Roar to disarm her, then she's just gonna stay where she is. Even if she's doing a range attack, she's not gonna move back to lose a disadvantage because she'll be disarmed. And then the following turn, we can actually push her into the trap, actually probably this one because it'll be more convenient. And that will be two damage here plus seven damage there which should be nine damage and that should kill her. So this works out perfectly. It also saves us using our boots, which not, doesn't matter too much, but all right. So provoking roar at 10. For the spell weaver, we kind of already planned out what our turn was gonna be. We're gonna use these two cards to make two attacks, trying to kill number two. And between the brute and ourselves, we should eliminate two attackers. So yeah, uh, we're gonna go our earlier initiative, which is going to be seven here. And we flip and flip. I guess I should double check that this is getting the spell weaver cards when I play them. Yeah, perfect. All right. Flip for the monsters. 14. Gonna be making a trap, actually. <laughs> kind of annoying, but I guess it shouldn't matter too much. And the guards are at 30. All right, spell weaver goes first at 10. So, it could be a little bit tempting to try to do this attack three, but then we need to get a positive modifier. Because um, then we could use the bottom to heal the brute one. We're not gonna do this, though. This is too risky. All right. So,. Let's do, I guess the order doesn't matter too much. Uh, we'll do the bottom attack first. Because mm, I guess experience. I always use the top attack on this one. Maybe we want to move. Nah, right, we'll do the top attack first. All right. Top attack first, attack two, range three, targeting guard number two. Ugh, come on. All right, so one damage to guard number two. Then we're going to do the bottom attack, attack two, range two, gain one experience. Targeting guard number two, positive modifier. Oh, thank God. All right, that's a relief at least. Some justice in the world. All right, so we kill guard number two. And we are done. Really gotta remember to use those goggles. I just don't see her cards. All right, then the brute goes at 10, move four off of the bottom, grab and go. One, two, three, four, right up to the elite archer. And use provoking roar as an attack to disarm targeting the archer. Plus one, three damage, that's nice. Okay, just move this over onto archer number four, and she is disarmed. Don't really need to place this because she's going to be the next one to go, but I just want to be thorough. And the brood is done. So now the archer goes. So she can't attack, loses a disarm. Since she can't attack, she basically functions as if she's just moving towards her focus. She's already adjacent to her focus, so she doesn't need to move at all. She just stays there. And then she creates a three damage trap in an adjacent empty hex closest to an enemy. So we need to grab a trap real quick. 
which is right here. And so she's just gonna place it right there. So that's a three damage trap as opposed to the four damage trap on the other side. It's actually really annoying. Uh, it's actually blocking the spot, but fortunately, um, leaving Cleave actually gives us jobs. So we still will be able to move over here, push her into that trap, just as we planned. Just like we drew it up, right? All right, and speaking of, it's actually, oh no, we do have the other guard who has to go now. So this guard's focus is going to be the Spellweaver. This is actually a little bit annoying because he's actually gonna block the door now. This creates a bit of a hazard, in fact. But it's not the end of the world because I think we're gonna kind of eliminate this room, deal with this room pretty quickly. So guard number four uh, makes an attack minus one. So this is just gonna be an attack two, targeting a Spellweaver, plus zero, so two damage. Not the end of the world, like I said. And that is the end of the round. All right, so the Brute, we already know what we're gonna do next round. It's gonna be leaving Cleveland to jump over here, um, warding strength to push her into the trap. Going at 32, which is the earliest of the two, because obviously we want to go before them if we can. Yeah, Spellweaver doesn't have a lot of options here. We could consider short resting on the Spellweaver to get some other cards back, but I think that's okay. Um, there's a small risk here, which is that if the guard goes early, attacks us, and gets a positive modifier, we will actually have to lose cards, um, which is pretty bad. But if he doesn't get a positive modifier, we should just take three, and then we can heal ourselves for three and kind of move away to kite him. So I think this is fine. I think it's not necessary to short rest here to get cards back. I think we'll be okay. We're just gonna kind of stall him out while the Brute takes care of business. Uh, as you can see, the Spellweaver, especially early on, isn't really that great at single target scenarios. She much prefers AoE, which isn't really what we've been presented with, except for the very first turn with Fire Orbs. All right, so 70 on the Spellweaver, 32 on the Brute, 50 on the Guard, 56 on the Archer. All right, the good news is the Archer is going late. Um, so the guard is actually, no, sorry, the brute is going to be first. So we're going to do a move three jump. Ah, we're actually creating the wind. Dude, we lost that crackling air. But this doesn't mean we still have skewer, so we can at least do a pump up skewer. So move three jump, creating an air. I'm just going to move two to over here. We could move there, but I think it doesn't really change much. I think being here is fine. Um, and then we do an attack three, push two. So first we're going to flip for an attack. So we really just need to not get something too bad here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just when you want the crit, right? All right, well, that is something not too bad. All right. Oh, no, that is bad. Oh, that is so bad. Oh, my God. Oh, there's no justice in the world. How could a good modifier be bad? All right, the reason why this is bad is this is going to double our attack three to make it six, which if you see six plus a three on her, that is lethal. So she's dead. This is bad because she's not going to get rid of the trap for us <laughs> using our push. Ugh. All right. So she is dead there, and we're done. Uh, don't need to healing potion or anything, and we're going to be short resting. All right, now the guard goes. I have to really hope he doesn't get a positive modifier here. Oh, that's the worst. Oh, that is the worst. Well, the Spellweaver is... I mean, it's okay, because there's only one room left. It's not the absolute end of the world. Man, we have not had luck with the modifiers. All right. So we actually have no cards in our hand since we played these two cards. Um, so we actually are going to have to lose a card, two cards from our discard now. Can't lose Reviving Ether. So yeah, it's pretty much just going to be uh, Flame Strike and Frost Armor, I guess. I guess we could theoretically keep Flame Strike over Mana Bolt. I don't know if we. Uh, I guess the Brute can use the Wind. So there's no really guarantee that we're going to power up Mana Bolt. And Flame Strike is actually an attack three, although from closer range. I don't know, it's close. The early initiative matters as well. Also the bottom heal gives us more flexibility, although we're not going to have any other top attacks after we do this. So yeah, actually Flame Strike is probably better to keep, just as an attack three rather than an attack two. So we lose Frost Armor and Mana Bolt. We are going to have to revive the quite quickly here. Okay, uh, so the Archer's dead. You don't have to worry about her. It's just the guard. I mean, sorry, it's just the spell which goes now. Uh, all right. So we can't get past. Too bad we didn't have that move four jump now. Um, so we're just going to do a heal three on ourselves. Which just heals for two. And I don't think we're going to move at all. I mean, we could move away, but this would actually just make it much longer before we have to get back there. And longevity might be an issue for the Spellweaver now, as she's already pretty low on cards. If we take a hit at this point, we're at six life. So unless they get a crit, we're fine. God, I, I shouldn't have said that. All right. So that's that. Huh, actually, no, change of plan. So again, nothing has happened yet, so we can always change our plans. I think what I'm going to do instead, oh, this is a little bit risky, I think not too risky, uh, is I'm actually going to do just a generic top two attack, because I think I can long rest next round. 
uh, to get the two health back anyway. I go to 99, so as long as the Brute can you know, go before the guard, which I think he should be able to do, then I won't get attacked no matter what, so there's no risk of me having to lose another card, and this will again extend my longevity. Um, also because right now if I short rest, I have, you know, I mean, you know, one in four chance of losing Reviving Ether, 50% chance of losing a card I really don't want to lose, which is Flame Strike or the Reviving Ether. Uh, if I lose Reviving Ether, I have to lose one life anyway. Yeah, I think this is actually better. All right, let's do that. I don't regularly think about doing melee attacks with the Spellweaver, but it does come up sometimes. All right, so which one we use doesn't really matter. We'll just use the top of Eight from the Aether as a plus two. There is an attack two, plus zero. What's up? It's two damaging our number four. This two damage is also significant for another reason, which is theoretically we're thinking that we're going to um, Skewer using the Wind uh, for the Brute next turn, which is actually going to be attack four, plus the two here is enough to kill the guard. All right, so those were our two cards. And like I said, we're going to long rest, so we don't need short rest in her. The Brute is going to short rest. We're going to have to shuffle the Brute's modifier deck as well. <laughs> oh, that's rough. I can't re-roll here, though, because we really can't afford to lose Skewer and grab and go or some, yeah, something for some movement here. Hmm. Actually, though, all right, let's have a look. The only thing we really need to keep is Skewer, because that is what's going to kill that guy. Anything else here is probably okay, in fact. I mean, grab and go for the four movement doesn't work that well because then we're at initiative 35, whereas we can just go early initiative, use our boots to make sure that we get next to that guard before she, he can attack the Spellweaver. So yeah, actually, I think I am going to do that because then we'll be missing two health rather than one. We can long rest to get the boots back, which we're going to use to move up next to him. All right, so actually, we will re-roll here. So we really don't want to use ske lose Skewer, but that is the only thing we can possibly lose here that would be terrible. All right, Shield Bash, perfect. That's great. Well, at least one, one roll worked out for us. All right, and then we need to reshuffle this so that we can get into the next round. Oh, I'm an idiot. I, I even thought about it. I swear I thought about it. I, I just, I don't know, I get so distracted, I guess, by talking. So I, the Spellweaver meant to use the Eagle Eye Goggles there again. This is actually going to be a recurring trend for this thing. It's just that the Spellweaver actually doesn't have any items. Uh, so the reason why I was going to use the Eagle Eye Goggles is because I knew I was going to long rest on the Spellweaver. So the Eagle Eye Goggles there were pretty free, even though it's not a lot of value. I should have put my phone on silent, that was a mistake. Um, even though it's not a lot of value to just do an attack two uh, with advantage, it's still better than nothing and it's basically free since we are going to long rest and get the spent item back. Ah, uh, well, I mean, I could revert these things, but I don't want there to be any suspicions about this playthrough, so I'll just not do that. All right, so we need to do four movement on the Brute, and we want to skewer. We don't actually have to get next to him, but we'd like to, because in case we get a negative modifier or miss or something, um, then we want to make sure that the guard does attack us rather than her. And we need to go early, only real early initiative at this point, where we want to make sure we go before the guards for sure, and they have 15s, and they actually have still two 15s left, so two out of five there is pretty risky, so we need provoking roars at 10 with our boots to get next to him. Over his long resting, so nothing to do there. So we play 10, guard flips, 50. Well, wasn't so necessary, but whatever. Use the boots, plus the bottom of provoking roar for a total of move four. One, two, three, four. And then we're going to skewer him, consuming the wind. We gain one experience for this attack. It's an attack four, pierce one. Ugh. All right, three damage. So actually that's five, on guard number four. Okay, that's our turn. <sighs> now the guard attacks us, makes an attack three. Yeah, now there's some luck at least, some justice. We still have to do with that trap, which we didn't push anything into. We're actually just gonna have to tank the trap now. Or I guess we can, we both do have jump, so I guess we can just jump over him. All right, so that's that. Now the spell weaver goes, needs two life. I'm really curious to see, because if there was a plus one on those goggles, it actually would have been the difference between killing that guy and not. And we're going to choose to lose... Hmm, probably aid from the ether, because we just want a bigger move here. Yeah. I think that's what it's going to be, because we're going to play Flame Strike plus Impaling Eruption to kill him, move up a bunch, and then play Short Rest and then Reviving Ether afterwards. All right, yeah, that looks good. Okay, so now it's the Brute's turn. Well, it's actually both people's turn, I guess. Uh, huh. So it's pretty much I was picking up money here. Huh, okay. Yeah, picking up money is nice. How greedy do we want to be? I think we want to be a little bit greedy here, right? Yeah, I like to be a little bit greedy. All right, 
So what we're gonna do here, oh no, we can't be greedy, because they've got a 50% chance. I, all right, so what I wanted to do, at least, was to do these two cards, right? <laughs> Presumably, the Spellweaver kills this guy, because he's only got one health left, so unless she misses, she kills him, which is pretty low probability she misses. Uh, and then I would do the loot one, grabbing both these coins, and then move three to get this coin. Oh, it would have been so juicy. But, like I said, they actually have a 50% chance to go at 15, and the Spellweaver early finished at 36 here. So that's not gonna work. Well, actually, oh yeah. yeah. All right, so I guess it's probably more like this. So the point is we wanna go, even though we can't go before the guard, if he goes at 15, we wanna go before the Spellweaver goes. I guess the Spellweaver could just go later of the two initiatives, but then we're just getting too greedy, I think. And we have gotten punished a little bit already in the scenario, so it's careful. It's important that we're, I think, a little bit careful going forward. So, yeah, I think Spare Dagger as our earliest initiative is always going to be the card. And then we kind of have two options between, I would say, Leaf and Cleave, because it gets us there, or Grab and Go. Um, I actually like Grab and Go here. The reason being, we can still do our Attack 2 bottom on Spare Dagger. If it misses or whatever, then we can do an Attack 2 top generic on Grab and Go. But otherwise, if it hits, then we can actually still use Grab and Go as a loot to grab both the coins here. So I like this. All right, that's what we're going to do. Goes 27, and like I said, the term is already planned out for the Spellweaver, which is going to be 36. So we flip both. The guard gets the 15. Ugh. But it is the retaliate, not the attack. So that's something. All right, let's see here. Uh, we also actually forgot to shuffle the monster modifier deck, which we're going to do right now. Uh, the reason why there are sleeves on the these, but nothing else, is because well, we didn't sleeve the, our game from the very beginning, which is a mistake. You should definitely sleeve the game. It's huge quality of life improvement. Uh, anyway, so we didn't sleeve from the beginning, so a lot of cards already got pretty dirty, and we didn't really bother with sleeving at that point. We have sleeves because we have a second copy of the game anyway. I mean, from the second edition. This one was obviously from the first. Um, and so we do plan on sleeving that one, but for this one, we just kind of sleeve the things we use a lot. So normally when we're playing, we do sleeve the cards we're playing with, but obviously we're playing with characters which aren't these two right now, so these new ones are not sleeved, uh, since I'm just using these for this walkthrough. Um, and we don't have enough small sleeves, actually, because we just had kind of one extra pack of each, large and small, laying around, um, to sleeve all the modifier cards, so we just leave the monster ones, because they're the ones that get shuffled the most. All right. So, guard goes first, shield of retaliates. Now the brood has a choice. We can still try to do our attack to bottom, but if we if we miss, or even actually if we get a minus, any negative modifier here actually doesn't kill because he's shield one now. Um, and so the two, oh no, actually only a minus, so minus two and a miss don't kill. Huh, yeah, I mean I'm greedy, let's, let's be honest, I like money. So as long as we don't get a minus two or miss, this will do a one damage, which will kill him, so we won't get retaliate. If we get a minus two or miss, we get heavily punished here because we don't kill him, we take two retaliate damage. But like I said, I'm greedy, I like the money. So we can do an attack two bottom. All right, plus two, perfect. Whew. Greed pays, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so that was the bottom of Fair Dagger, then we're gonna use the top of Grab and Go and loot one. Getting all the money. So then the Spell Weaver's turn. Fortunately, this book for now doesn't do anything, but that's okay. One, two, three, four. Moving to right there. All right. So Spell Weaver now has to decide to long rest or short rest. Let's see, the Brute has three cards left. Hmm. So how are these turns gonna play out? Brute can't currently jump over. Can I actually move up to the coin and then jump the following turn? Yeah, I think that's good. So the Brute's plan is gonna be to go to the coin next turn. And then the following turn, use Leaping Cleave to jump over, probably attacking with Spare Dagger once we enter the new room. So the Spellweaver is going to revive me after this turn, and then, we'll, ah, Spellweaver actually won't be able to jump over. That's a problem. Because Reviving Ether is actually the only jump um, for the Spellweaver, I believe, by default. Yeah, we have no other jumps. So the Spellweaver actually won't be able to jump over a trap. I guess Spellweaver will have to tank a trap. Whew, man, not pushing that guy into the trap is a problem. So this leaves other options, which is the Brute could, for example, run into the trap this turn. We can ignore the coin. Uh, that would deal four damage to him, but then he could long rest the following turn. Well, maybe like the Spellweaver heals or something. Yeah, I guess that's going to be better, since I really... I mean, tanking four damage on the Spellweaver going down to two. Normally, the Spellweaver will stay behind, but we have Skeletons in the coming room, and they do two-target attacks. Vanded Archer, as you've seen, can also flip a two-target. Nah, let me shuffle this while we're at it. 
So I think I don't want to sit around with Spell Weaver on two health. So I think it's going to be better to tank the trap, do a little bit of healing, go a little bit slower into this room, and probably not pick up a coin, although we may still end up picking it up. We do like to pick up coins when possible. I think my gameplay might be even a little bit too skewed to picking up coins because we've been at you know, Prosperity 7, Prosperity 8 for a really long time. Experience and things like this don't matter much. So we kind of play scenarios just to beat them and to get coins. All right. Uh, I didn't forget any other shuffles, did I? Sometimes good to check this. No, all good. All right, so I think that's the plan. So if that is the plan, the question then is, yeah, no, so we can still short rest on the Spellweaver because then the Spellweaver will revive me after the following turn and then heal afterwards. Yeah, all right, looks good. So the Brute is going to just do a move three, whichever one doesn't really matter. Yeah, all right, we'll just do something like this. All right, so Spellweaver short resting. I Oopsies, I should do that. Using this, doesn't matter which one of these two cards we lose. No, doesn't matter. Yeah. So Spellweaver is always playing Reviving Ether here, and I guess moving and grabbing the coin is actually what it is. And the Brute is always moving onto the trap. Actually, which card do we want to keep the most? Uh, yeah, we'd rather keep Leaving Cleave than Sweeping Blow, so we'll play Sweeping Blow so we can't randomly lose Leaving Cleave because it's our best attack that's left. All right, so 32 and 36. All right, Brute goes first. Just going to do a move three. One, two, three, onto the trap. Voluntarily springing traps, huh? Right. And take four damage, going from eight to four. Still have a healing potion as well, we're not gonna use that right now. So we're gonna theoretically get five healing between three from her and two from our long rest. Then the Spellweaver goes, moves to here. Picking up this coin, goes in the discard, playing Reviving Ether, getting all the lost cards back. We're back in business, boys. All right. So the Brew is going to long rest this turn. Spell Weaver is going to do some healing. And probably some summoning, actually. I think that looks good here. Yeah, I like it. Oh, <laughs> a new. A new. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'd like to heal, but then, and I can't heal here because then, ugh. Well, I guess we won't be getting a summon out. All right, so we're probably just going to heal. We could do double heal since we don't need to move. Double heal, we'll heal effectively one, but why not? We've got nothing else we're doing here. The following turn, yeah, it's gonna be something like you know, move four there and then fire orbs, and then after that we can use that for frost armor. We didn't end up getting to use crackling air here. It's not that big of a deal. So yeah, I think this is what we do. So initiative doesn't matter because the person's long resting, they're in a monster. So we go at seven, we just do a double heal. So healing your root for six. Actually, so yeah, that didn't change much of anything because now the long rest will do nothing, but oh well. So those are our two cards. Brute Long Rests gets his boots back. Gets to choose which card to lose. Um, well, so there are no traps left, so push doesn't matter so much. We may still use Warding Strength in this next room. Uh, big move is still kind of good. Yeah, I think Sweeping Blow is just definitely the worst card left. Pretty easy to get rid of here. All right. Time to tackle the last room. Um, so what's the plan here? I move in, make a range attack, right? It's the safest. It's usually how we enter rooms. You can say uh, so we kind of want to plan our following turns out. So the big attack or the attacks we're really interested in doing later on will be kind of leaving cleave and provoking roar, maybe with the possibility of skewer. Um, yeah, I guess I should show this stuff here. Uh, so these are kind of the attacks we want. These attacks don't really matter. We'll probably want to use the bottom of warding strength at some point, and this is a move. So we're kind of looking at like, well, these three tops and these three bottoms is probably how it looks here of our six remaining cards. Uh, the only possibility is that we would use Skewer if we use the bottom of Leaving Cleave. So we can kind of pair these two cards off and that means we can kind of do something like this. That actually looks pretty good kind of as a pairing here. So using a big move here plus Spare Dagger, follow that up probably with some combination of, you know, I mean these two cards actually don't go together. I mean, they'll be like, we use this move with maybe this attack, and then we can use, you know, this bottom with this or something, or just a move, you know. But I just mean, that no matter what, we're gonna play these two cards for top and bottom. Either like this will be a bottom, because then we'll be using these tops, or this will be a top if we use this bottom. All right, so yeah, grab and go and spare dagger is pretty safe here. Gives us enough movement, enough range to make sure that we hit something as we enter this room at 27. Spellweaver, all right. How greedy could we be? We could be very greedy, actually. 
We could be very greedy. Yeah, let's let's change that up a little bit. Let's be greedy. Let's try to go big, right? I mean, what's what's the point of playing the game if we're not gonna go big? We can take one more turn to do some setup. I think that looks pretty good. And then really go ham. So we're gonna save all these cards. We're gonna use this because we're gonna create wind so that she can actually get crackling air up. <clears throat> Yeah, so we can actually move back one so she gets one closer. Yeah, that's perfect. That's going to let us do a really big turn and make this room much easier, I think. All right, yeah, so we're going to just basically do a turn of doing nothing except creating air for her, which is kind of wasted, but I think we have enough cards left that we can get away with this, and I think it's going to make such a big impact for her. I mean, it's basically adding, I mean, eight damage in this next room um, that I think it's worth it. So we're kind of going to front load, spending extra cards now to have more impact later. And this is obviously a lot different than when she plays Ride with the Wind because that's a loss. Here we're just playing a uh, regular card. So... We're just going to go with Crackling Air, and we need to go late, I guess, because we want to go after it. It's unfortunate because it actually means we're going to lose movement. This is not so good. All right. So this is kind of playing open-handed, although how I would explain this is basically if we were communicating in the game normally, I would say, can you make air for me so that, you know, so that we can set up? I can get my big buff up. Uh, which I need air for, and then when we go into the room, I'll be much more powerful. <clears throat> this is me as a spell we were speaking. And so the brute would say, yeah, sure. Uh, I can go great air, but I can't go so early uh, if it's convenient for me. And she said, well, actually, I need you to go pretty early because otherwise I'm going to have to play this because really what I'd like to do is play these two cards now, right? And then use this move four plus this to the attack. So I actually do need you to go pretty early. And the brute says, ugh, how early? I said, well, probably in the first quarter of the round. And that's unfortunate for me because I'm going to have to use Provoking Roar instead. But I think it's probably going to be worth it. So it looks like that's what we're going to do instead. So we've audibled a little bit, multiple times, but should make it work. So we're going to lead 25 and 10. No monsters to flip. Brute goes first. Um, does nothing with the top. And we're going to actually move one away from the door. Because when we go in, we're still going to do the same plan as before of using a big move with grab and go, plus spare dagger, plus we have the boots. That's six movement, so we can pretty safely get to almost anywhere in the room. So we're actually going to move back one with leaping cleave, creating wind. All right, and so then uh, what am I going to use for this? Hold on one second. I just like to use a little token. So then as the spell weaver, we're just going to do a bottom generic move two, move up next to the door so that we're closer, so we can hit everything with our AoE. And then we're going to play crackling air, powered up with wind, so we're going to place this here. Oops. Yeah, place this here. This is what I wanted. I just placed a little something just so that I remember that it actually was powered up with wind. Because just powering up once with wind will add plus two instead of plus one to all the following attacks. And then we put this here. And that's that. And the wind is gone. All right, next round. Now we go in. It's time. We've dirtled around long enough. All right. So Brute's going to go first. Yeah, 27. Same plan as before. And we're going to go, yeah. Between our two initiatives, we've got a pretty tough choice here. Make sure that the camera's still fine. Yep, camera's still doing fine. All right, we're gonna go at 69. Yeah, the camera sees all the stuff. All right. <laughs> I'm paranoid about that since this is the first time I've done this. All right, 27 and 69. So, Brute goes first. We start just doing move four. We've got two movement left after we hit the door. There's some scenario stuff we read, I believe. But I think no special rules. Just gonna double check. Yeah, just some text to read and a bunch of stuff to set up in this room. All right, so we've got a treasure chest there. Ooh, piece of candy. All right, got some desks, tables there and there. We got a ton of money, which you know I like. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some enemies we're gonna have to face too. Unfortunately, which is two banded archers and two living bones. Oops. Living bones don't like tables. All right, so that's set up. Let me flip them. Archers, ooh, plus one attack. That's not great. Minus one move. I only have. Yeah, they still have two movement, so that's good enough. Oops. Well, actually, this I can just get out of the way. So there are no more guards now, we know. So we can just move this down. 
and flip the living bones. Ah, that's great actually. So the living bones aren't moving, which is going to make it pretty easy for us, since we, as long as we don't get next to them, we're not going to attack anything. So the archers have minus one movement. They have three movement, so two by default, except, so the furthest they can get is basically here and here. And they have four range, so yeah, they can easily attack anywhere. So there's no avoiding their attacks, which are plus one, which are going to be attack threes. That's a lot of damage, but I think we'll be okay. All right, so we've still got two movement left. There's really no reason to use the boots here. Um, so let's see. Where does... Ugh. Ugh. So there's some, some things to consider here. Actually, rather unfortunate. So for fire orbs to hit three targets, the only place we could go as a spell weaver is to go to here, unless the archers move up. So actually, this does does leave us with some, some rather difficult choices, right? Hmm. So my point is, yeah, we really want to hit three things we can, and we really like to hit the bandit archers more than anything, because we're going to do five damage theoretically to each of them, and with our advantage attacks, we might even kill them. Whereas living bones are kind of less of a priority, although still decent hit. But we'd really just more than anything like to hit three targets. In order to be able to hit three targets from without moving to here, which puts us, because we go before the living bones, we could have actually gone our later initiative, would have made a big difference. Um, we would have to basically move anywhere along here. Anywhere along here means we can only attack up to this row. Archers have four range. Ah, so they actually will move up. All right, so all that for nothing, because in order to attack to the door, they have to move up to this row. One, two, three, four. All right, so that's fine. Just something we always want to make sure that we check on. So as long as the brute remains on the door, the archers will both move up to attack him, then the spellweaver can move into here, and we'll have three range, which can attack the two archers and the living bones, etc. All right, that's perfect. So we can stay where we are, and we'll just make an attack on living bones number three, because it's a lower number. Plus zero. Oh, we forgot to get. See, this is why we always get our experience first. So this means two damage to living bones number three, because he does have shield one. All right. We have no reason to use our boots, like I said. And then we end our turn. Now the archers go. So number two goes first. I'll have them move to the center of the room. Her move to the center of the room. And she makes an attack three, targeting the brute. Four. Not bad. All right. And the other archer will just move up one. And also make an attack three, targeting the brute. Miss. Okay. Well, that's a little bit fortunate. Oh, well. Uh, all right, so bones go after Spellweaver. Spellweaver has moved four. Just gonna use two of it. Mm, three, two, yeah, no, we always have to stay. We could stay here, which kind of gets us more out of the way. We can still target these three, but we actually want to target the living bones, which the brute hit, I think. I think it's pretty important to do that so that we have a higher probability of killing things, so we actually need to stay here. Because we want to hit the two archers, the archers are more of a threat than the bones. They, I mean, they actually hit for the same thing. The bones target two things, so I guess you could think that it's not, but as long as the brute, for example, gets up into this spot, the bones can only attack one thing anyway, kind of plug the gap. But we don't actually have early initiative on the brute so far, but the bones are pretty slow. But the archers, they're just gonna sit in the back and kind of plink at us, which is a little bit more annoying. So we'd really like to take care of them first. And uh, yeah, I think that's better. Plus, I have living ones of shield. I mean, it doesn't change much here because Right now we're doing attack five, which we're hoping to be like plus one because of the goggles, which we are going to use for once in this scenario. So they have effectively six health as well. So everything kind of needs a plus one to kill, except for living bones number three, which we're always going to be attacking. So the choice is just whether we attack the other living bones, one of the archers or two of the archers. And I prefer two of the archers because I consider them to be a bigger threat. So let's do it. All right, goggles, it's amazing. Uh, gain three experience, create a fire. Three experience because we targeted three things. And let's do it. We'll do Living Bones number three first. So these are all advantage attacks. Uh, so we're actually gonna do, so this is gonna go down three. One, two, three, I'm crackling air. So I should do gain two more experience. And these are all gonna be attack fives. Because um, so, this actually reads on your next four attacks, not attack actions, so, uh, not entire attack actions, I should say. So it's each individual attack does use one charge of this, but still definitely good here. So. Living Bones number three first, advantaged. All right, so this gives us a plus zero, which is a five, four damage. He's only got three life left, so he's dead. Archer number two, and advantage because of the goggles, plus one, so that makes that a six. That archer is also dead. Just the Spellweaver doing Spellweaver things. You can see the Spellweaver kind of has this, I don't know, 
at least at level one is not so great at single target. So there's that kind of time where the brute was really effective in here, and Spellweaver just didn't do much between fire orbs and fire orbs. Later on, Spellweaver will get more cards and be able to swap out kind of her crappier cards to be a bit more effective in these sort of situations. But in the beginning, it's true that you you really feel it feels very spiky playing a Spellweaver. But you can see, I mean, like basically just single handedly winning this room. Brute doesn't even need to be here. Uh, all right, and then on the last archer, yeah, okay, that'll do it. So that's a 10, which kills one more archer. And now we need to reshuffle this. Like I said, actually the Spellweaver now, well, I guess it's not completely true that she could have won, beat this room back. So no, she could have actually, because if she'd been the only one moving in there, she would have killed those three. Uh, actually she, yeah, we, you know, we actually wouldn't have killed that, the other living bones either. I think we still probably would have been able to do it by ourselves though. Um, because that living bones would have one life left, so the living bones would be a full. It's tough to say. Maybe not. Maybe not. But regardless, like I said, the spell here is a class which can. When it counts, when it's really important in situations like this, a lot of enemies in the board really have a, a disproportionately large impact for a level one class. But it does not always feel this way. Alright, so just shuffling everything up now. So this is the, the point in the scenario where we're kind of like, all right, you know, so, I mean, let, let's take stock of things, for example. Spellweaver has five cards left, is in short ref, so has mm, theoretically four turns uh, of actions left. Brood has two cards in his hand, four cards here, so it means one turn there, plus five, so that's two, two, I mean, sorry, you know, one, then five will be four turn, two turns, four will be two turns, so that's five, six, seven turns of actions left, yeah. We can kind of take it easy now. This is the point where we're like, all right, we really don't want to kill this last guy. We want to get that money. So that's what we're going to try to do here. First priority is obviously going to be getting the chest, since that's the most important. Coins are going to be the second priority. So interestingly enough, grab and go has now become maybe the most important card for the brute to keep. That is the one card I absolutely do not want to lose as the brute, because I want to use that to hoover up as many of these coins in the chest as possible. All right. So, Spellweaver can short rest. No real reason to long rest here. We don't need to extend our longevity much longer. We pretty much have no difficulty winning this scenario at this point, I think. Cross armor, sure. Ah, this takes down. So, Brute's turn is always pretty obvious here. I would, I, even though we can afford to play a loss here, I don't think we're going to play the move six. Just a loss. It was like a move six loot one. Yup, but uh, just a move six now. So, let's play this 32, and we'll see what we're going to do with it afterwards and yeah and the spell weaver so i guess we're just it's actually risky to attack i mean i could use flame strike but i'm afraid we would actually end up killing this guy too quickly um so what do we want to do i think we're going to move four no matter what here the question is whether we attack at all no i think the brute we'll leave the brute to attack we'll just do a heal um so we're just gonna do yeah like something like this Move four, heal three, just to kind of extend things. We don't, we could be attacking, but we don't want to attack because if we kill that guy, scenario is over. I'm gonna try to grab some more of this money before we get in this scenario. So 70 and 32. Living Bones flips. 25. Not bad. All right, so Living Bones goes first. Actually, gonna attack both of us. Movement plus one, but attack minus one. So he's gonna move to here and make attacks of one, targeting each of us. Uh, lower initiatives on the brute, so it attacks the brute first. Zero damage on the Spellweaver. Three damage. Okay. Fortunately, we're healing. We don't really care. Brute goes next. Maybe we are going... Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> if we do use the move six, we could go all the way to there. It does give us an experience as well. And then, where could we go to loot the most? Yeah, that's actually possible. All right. I like it. I'll explain why. Well, you'll see why, basically. So we actually are just going to use this attack three, push two. Uh, might as well use our healing potion while we're at it, just to make sure. So use that. Flip. So four, so three damage to skeleton number four. Definitely did not want, not want to attack him on the spell weaver. That was correct. And might as well actually use the push as well to kind of center him back with the cash. So we'll use the push two. Push it back to there. And then we're gonna use our move six, gaining one experience. Because experience is nice and gold is nice. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we grab the chest, 
Obviously, we do immediately read what's in the chest. Um, I'm not going to do that though. I actually don't remember. Um, and sometimes, well, anyway, yeah, I'm not gonna say anything more, but you should immediately read what's in the chest. Obviously, I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna spoil anyone who hasn't opened the chest yet. Okay, then the Spellweaver goes, she's gonna heal herself for three, and then do a move four. One, two, three, four. We're gonna grab the money in this corner. The Brute's gonna grab the money in the other corner. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Spellweaver, we're just gonna play our two remaining cards. Go as early as possible, doesn't matter too much. Brute's gonna short rest. Yeah, that's fine, don't really care about that. So what we wanna do here is just move to the far corner and loot. I mean, in order to move to the far corner, we need one, two, three, four, five, which boots plus the move three here. Works perfectly, so these two cards. All right, let's do it. Seven and 54. Living Bones. Yeah, this is a pretty annoying thing where they target one enemy with all attacks, but whatever. Question is, maybe we should kill him now? Yeah, I think we can attack him. Uh, the fire's gone as well. I think we can do a small attack on him. Yeah, healing doesn't really matter. We're only missing one health combined. Yeah, sure. We'll do a small attack on him. Because that shouldn't kill him. Just prime him for death and then grab another coin. So we'll just do an attack two, range three. So three, two damage. Ah! Zoot. Ah, sorry, French cursing. Uh, darn. All right, well, he's dead. Yeah, it was greedy to attack, but I also don't want to extend this too long, so it's not the biggest deal. I mean, you understand that if I was playing for real, I might be a little bit more cautious about not killing him just to grab more money. Then we do move three, plus the boots for five. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, what's actually the most? There's four, there's four. Yeah, there's nowhere that we can go that doesn't give us four. So whatever, we'll go up like here. And do loot one, getting a bunch of coins. And that's the scenario. So yeah, I mean, we played on hard. We still won by a lot. Uh, we did get, I guess, kind of lucky and unlucky combined. So it's tough to say. Uh, could we have played any losses there? No, it didn't matter. So yeah, uh, I'm not sure what else there is to say. Hope that helps. Again, the really important things are to avoid playing losses early on. That's so why we've obviously got away with that, but then we still try to modulate how many losses we play. We don't go crazy, that's point one. Point two is really to try to play around what you see the monsters are doing to avoid attacks. Like I said, the perfect example of that was that turn when we came in here, actually backing out to avoid all the attacks in the room rather than taking a ton of damage. Things like this are a really big deal and small, small decisions like that turn can completely change the, the outcome of the game. So yeah, that's it. Um, hope I didn't make too many mistakes other than uh, all that Spellweaver shenanigans or nonsense with the eagle eye goggles. And yeah, oh, I'm an idiot actually. I did forget something else. Uh, the crackling air actually would have, yeah, that, that attack was always stupid. Uh, I forgot that I had crackling air over there, which is really difficult for me to remember the Spellweaver. I guess uh, I have too much of brood at heart, but yeah. So because we had crackling air, that attack was in attack four. So it was always gonna kill the skeleton unless we basically missed. Uh, Minus two, yeah, minus two actually would, wouldn't have done it. Would not have killed him either, but yeah. So we probably should have never made, I mean, we definitely wouldn't have made that attack if we're playing for real, because one more turn at least of getting coins. Um, but yeah, that's it. Hope this helped.